Good afternoon. Since our last uh, press conference about a week ago, the number of uh, daily infections has uh, stabilised at around 3,000 cases a day. Both the week-on-week -week ratio of infections and the number of serious cases have also remained stable at uh, around 1. We will continue to monitor the situation closely and take a careful step-by-step -step approach to resuming economic and social activities. We will make further adjustments to our safe management measures. On dining in, last week we announced that up to five fully vaccinated persons from the same household can dine in together at F&B establishments first and later at hawker centres and coffee shops once we have sorted out the details with the stakeholders. The NEA and the Singapore Food Authority have been engaging the hawker centres and coffee shop stakeholder op operators and associations. By the end of November, the majority of hawker centres will be able to put in place the necessary control measures so that up to five persons from the same household can dine in together. NEA and SFA will update with uh, further details once they have been worked out with the stakeholders. We will also extend the concession to coffee shops who are able to put in place the necessary checks. We have announced earlier pilots to allow vaccinated persons with additional pre-activity tests or what we call VDS plus test to enjoy relaxed SMMs in some settings such as selected mass sporting events and mice events. If we are able to conduct these pilots successfully, we will expand this VDS plus test protocol to additional settings. This will be an important signal of our ability to manage COVID-19 safely even as we reopen. Migrant workers make significant contributions to our economy and our society, and we must continue to care for their well-being, including their mental well-being. From 3rd December, we will allow migrant workers residing in dormitories <laughs> to visit recreation centres and selected places in the community with the necessary safeguards in place. Minister Tan Si Ling will share more details later. We also continue to upgrade our border measures in line with global situations and update the country region classification. In addition, we intend to further expand the vaccinated travel lane scheme to include India, Indonesia, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Minister Iswaran will, el will elaborate later. Our discussions with Malaysia on a VTL-like arrangement for our land links has progressed well. We are working to launch this soon, hopefully in a few weeks' time. Singapore and Malaysia share close ties on many fronts, especially among our people. Many families have been separated from one another for a long time because of border restrictions. We hope this uh, land link arrangement will allow many of them to be reunited, and they will be one of our priorities. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for your patience and for your support. As we resume more economic and social activities, uh, we do expect the number of COVID-19 cases to rise. However, with vaccinations and boosters, as well as vaccin vaccination-differentiated SMMs, we hope that the number of serious cases can be kept low. This will avoid overtaxing our hospital system and our healthcare workers. We will continue to adjust our measures as we progressively reopen so that we can protect lives while preserving livelihoods. I would like to remind everyone <clears throat> to continue to remain vigilant, exercise social responsibility, and test yourselves regularly as and when needed. Let us work hand in hand as we journey towards living with COVID-19. Thank you. Now I'll ask Minister Ong Yi Kang to give an update on the healthcare side. Thank you. Um, today, let us once again run through the, the key components of the pandemic, safe management measures at the borders as well as domestically, vaccines and boosters, and finally our healthcare system. I'll touch on the first two while DMS will touch on uh, aspects about the healthcare system. Um, but let me first provide an overview of the pandemic situation. 
Uh, last week, MTF announced some very calibrated relaxation of safe management measures. These relaxation will lead to more social interactions, in fact already have, and actually we should expect higher transmission rate and infection cases in the coming days and weeks. Uh, however, while this is happening, we are also administering more booster shots and more people are also recovering safely from infection and become resilient to the virus. So this counteracts against higher social interactions and infections and we hope that overall the situation can remain in check. Even if it does not, with stricter vaccination differentiated measures, we hope that the number of vulnerable unvaccinated individuals being exposed to the virus and then infected can be kept low and our hospitals will not come under pressure. We hope we will not. And it will also be a matter of time before boosters and safe recovery of individuals will increase our population immunity and then bring the infections back down again. And when that happens, the week-on-week -week ratio will fall below one again and this will give us scope to implement further uh, relaxation of restrictions. Hence, our approach, uh, as we always say, is not a big bang approach, but a constant suppression of the virus with boosters and safe recovery of people. And then when the situation, when the observed situation improve, we relax more measures. And this will be a careful and deliberate process, applying brakes to our bicycle that's going downhill and reach an equilibrium and reach our destination safely. Uh, as for border measures, we continue to monitor the situation in all parts of the world closely. Our key objective is to ensure that travel will not impose a heavy burden on our healthcare system. In the past, border control is to prevent infections from, being, from entering our borders. Now, the objective is actually more focus on making sure it does not add pressure to our healthcare system. <clears throat> our assessment has not changed uh, since last week. While infections continue to rise in Europe, overall infection rates in various countries, including in Europe, are comparable to ours. In particular, I want to highlight Netherlands, uh, which is one of our VTL partners, they are experiencing infection rates that are now slightly higher than Singapore's and is also on an upward trajectory. And Netherlands has also imposed new social restrictions announced just over the weekend. However, we do not think it's necessary to rescind the VTL or reduce the VTL quotas as yet. Import cases or imported cases are still a very small fraction of total community cases and do not significantly affect local transmissions. In addition, there is a quota of only six flights a week from the Netherlands and most importantly, VTL travellers are all fully vaccinated and tested before departure and upon arrival. Hence, it is very unlikely that continuing with the VTL will increase the burden on our hospital system and our healthcare system. In the meantime, the pandemic situation has stabilized in more countries and we will be upgrading their risk categories. More countries that are now in category two can be accorded VTL status and Minister Isharan will be saying more about this. Let me move on to vaccinations. We have been reporting that 85% of our population have been fully vaccinated. I've been receiving many queries why our vaccine coverage appears to be lower than the reported figures in some other countries. And the reason is because some countries report vaccine coverage against eligible population, whereas we report against total population. So if we break down, so 85% of our population fully vaccinated, there's a remaining 15%. And if we break down the remaining 15% not vaccinated, it comprises as follows. 
1% who are not living in Singapore, 9% who are children below 12 and not eligible, and the remaining 5% who are eligible but chose not to vaccinate. And so if we recalculate this based on eligible population, we are around 94% vaccinated. It is one of the highest coverages in the world. MOH will provide both figures from henceforth in our daily press release to give a fuller picture of the progress of our vaccination exercise. Some members of the public have also asked MOH about the choice of boosters, specifically after taking two shots of the mRNA vaccine, should they now take Pfizer-BioNTech or should they take Moderna? As the expert committee, our EC19V, has recommended, the two mRNA vaccines can be used interchangeably, regardless of whether the first two doses were Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna. MOH has done a study recently on the relative effectiveness of Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna as booster shots in terms of reducing infection risk. We compared two combinations. Uh, one combination is PPP, means Pfizer-BioNTech, Pfizer-BioNTech, Pfizer-BioNTech as booster, PPP, versus PPM, means Pfizer-BioNTech, first dose, Pfizer-BioNTech, second dose, then Moderna, third dose, like what I have done and like what DMS has done. Uh, these, there are, other, there are results for other combinations, such as MMM, MMP, uh, but I, sh I should caution that the sample sizes for these are not very large and the statistics may not be as meaningful. But just comparing PPP and PPM, the results are as follows. Uh, relative to two Pfizer-BioNTech doses, PPP reduces, further reduces risk of infection by 62%. As for PPM, the reduction is 72%. So both mRNA vaccines work very well as boosters, with PPM having a slight edge. Regardless, the impact on the reduction of severity of illness is extremely high for both combinations. There has also been a lot of interest from parents on children vaccines. MOH has signed a new supply agreement with Pfizer, which includes deliveries of pediatric vaccines. And we are in constant contact uh, with Pfizer who will try to fulfill the deliveries as soon as possible. In the meantime, our own children vaccination trial is making progress. The purpose of this trial is to smoothen operations when we have to do it at scale because young children are involved. Uh, KK Hospital is overseeing it and planning to start recruitment of the first batch of participants. So if your child is between 5 and 11 years old, you can find out from the KKH's website and Facebook page more about the study as well as the registration details. And this will be available by end of this week. Uh, finally, let me talk about the vulnerable segments of our population and the most vulnerable amongst them are unvaccinated seniors. Uh, this is why we need vaccination differentiated measures to restrict places where unvaccinated persons can visit. And this is really to protect them from exposure to the virus. Of particular concerns are places with high footfall, high human traffic, and which seniors tend to frequent. And they are hawker centers, as well as coffee shops. NEA and SFA <clears throat> have been working on this. Ideally, we should have proper checks on vaccination status before someone enters a hawker centre or a coffee shop. And only those fully vaccinated can sit down, remove their masks and able to eat and talk. <clears throat> However, these are settings where implementation is challenging because of the layout of the premises. NEA has been engaging hawker associations and town councils and we'll be able to progressively implement this for our hawker centres. The first group of hawker centres will be able to put in the checking system 
before end of this month, before end November. For these hawker centres, fully vaccinated individuals from the same household can enter and then sit down and dine together in groups of five, just like restaurants. Other hawker centres will implement the same system with full checks soon after. As for coffee shops, SFA has been engaging the various operators. They will have the option of, one, doing thorough checks of all their patrons. And if they can do that, then members of the same household can sit down and dine in groups of five, just like restaurants. But if the coffee shops cannot do that and cannot do the thorough checks, then the usual groups of two will apply. And this system will also be progressively rolled out in the coming weeks. On the other hand, there are also many vaccinated seniors who are cautious and do not want to leave their homes very much. And even for much needed exercise, which they need. That is why through PA and People's Association, we are implementing activities for seniors to stay active. The response has been good so far. Programs have been introduced at 21 community clubs and integrated community hubs across Singapore. As of 10th of November, about 1,200 seniors have participated in these activities. They, inc they include exercises like Zumba, Qigong, wrist walks, live performances such as Teochew Opera and Ge Tai, and also movie screening. A lot of care was taken to conduct these activities for our seniors and do it safely. In fact, the rules that PA apply are generally more stringent than our standard safe management measures, and activities are also very strictly for fully vaccinated seniors. PA plans to progressively resume more senior-centric activities at the remaining community clubs if there continues to be good compliance and good response. I should also give a short update on the vaccination of seniors. Um, to date, for seniors 60 and above and unvaccinated, the number has gone down to about 61,000, lower than the number I reported last week. And this is really thanks to all the efforts that our mobile teams, our home vaccination teams, uh, as well as our va vaccination centres, uh, to be able to encourage more seniors to come forward and get themselves vaccinated. And so we will just keep on working at the number and reduce it. Soon we will be less than 60,000, I'm sure. Um, finally, regular testing. That's another way to protect ourselves. Our distribution of free kits to households is progressing well. Notwithstanding, many members of public need to purchase additional kits and they have been asking are there supply of more affordable uh, ART kits. MOH recognised this and has been working with the uh, HSA to introduce more good quality and affordable ART self-test kits in Singapore. Last week, HSA authorised a new kit called the Flowflex, Flowflex ART under the Pandemic Special Access route, and this is for self-test use. Additionally, two other test kits that have met our quality standards are now also undergoing registration with the HSA. One is called the All Test and the other called the Indicate. We expect some of these kits to be sold well below $10 and hopefully below $5 for each test. But we know these are commercial decisions, but the cost of these kits are considerably lower. So um, I will end here. Now let me hand the floor to... Um, DMS Kenneth Ma. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I will give a very short update on the situation in our hospitals presently. Yesterday, we reported a total of 1,723 cases of uh, COVID-19 infection, and that comprised 1,651 community cases, 66 dormitory resident cases, and six imported cases. The ratio of community cases in the past week over the week before was 0 0.97, which means the number of cases was less than what was reported one week earlier. These numbers do reflect less testing having taken place over the weekend, 
and we will await the figures for today, which will come out in MOH's press statement this evening. But the week-on-week -week ratio is likely to still be less than one. Amongst the community cases, there's been a small decrease in the absolute number of seniors above the age of 60 getting infected with COVID-19. And if we look at the age standardized rates of infection, their rates were the highest in the period of up to around the middle of October, and the rates have since trended downwards thereafter. And this is likely the effect of booster vaccinations now affecting and improving outcomes uh, for this age group. The majority of cases, more than 98%, uh, remain asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And more than 87% of the cases were successfully onboarded to our home recovery program or accommodated in community isolation facilities as they were not able to isolate safely at home. Less than 7% of cases needed to be cared for in the hospitals, either because they had more severe symptoms or because they had high risk factors for worse outcome from their COVID-19 infection. Of the 1,525 cases in the hospital yesterday, 242 cases needed oxygen supplementation in the general wards. 52 patients had unstable medical conditions and needed to be kept under close monitoring in the ICU. A further 69 cases were critically ill, intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation in the ICU. The overall number of active cases who were critically ill, intubated in the ICU or who were unstable and needed this close monitoring was about 121 and the ratio of these active cases in the ICU in the past week over the week before was 0.94. So we are seeing a small decrease in the numbers of cases in the ICU. There were also 132 non-COVID cases who were critically ill in the ICU, and the overall ICU utilization rate was about 63.3%. Our doctors and nurses continue to work hard in the ICUs of our public hospitals to care for their patients. The slight decrease in the number of cases, both COVID and non-COVID, in the ICU is a promising uh, trend. It provides a slight reprieve, but we will need to see and watch the figures closely over the next few weeks to see if the trend is sustained. And if so, I do look forward to the hospitals allowing more of their staff to go on leave and get a well-earned rest. Our ICU capacity at this time remains sufficient to accommodate all our severe cases and we will continue to monitor the situation further. When I look at the seven-day moving average of active cases above the age of 60 years who are critically ill and intubated in the ICU you know, per 100,000 population by their vaccination status, the proportion of cases who were not fully vaccinated remains high compared to those who were fully vaccinated. For example, for those above the age of 70 years, there were 45.8 per 100,000 who were not fully vaccinated, compared to 6.4 per 100,000 who were fully vaccinated. And for those between 60 and 69 years of age, 49.7 per 100,000 were not fully vaccinated, compared to 2.6 per 100,000 who were fully vaccinated. When considering the seven-day moving average for death per 100,000 population in the above 70 years age group, the death rate was 13.7 per 100,000 in the group not fully vaccinated compared to 1.6 in the fully vaccinated group. The death rate has not come down significantly in the past week yet, but it's too early to tell whether we will see a similar drop in death rates as the overall number of cases of COVID-19 decreases. And this is because there is a significant lag between a person getting infected, then getting seriously ill and needing critical care, eventually dying from COVID-19. In the past week, until you know, from the 8th of November until the 14th of November, there were 1,765 cases involving children less than 12 years of age. This represents about 10% of the total number of cases reported to MOH over the same time period. This is a slight increase in numbers compared to the week before, which was 1,667. This group remains a group of concern other than our seniors 
because we have as yet not been able to offer them COVID vaccination under our national vaccination program. And it's harder to get children to adhere to regular strict mask wearing and safe distancing measures. Minister Ong has shared that the EC19V is finalising its recommendations on vaccination for children between the ages of 5 and 12 years using the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And in the meantime, it is important for us to manage their risk of getting COVID through avoiding crowded places for them and minimising their mask-off interactions outside the home setting. Even though children have a mild infection and make a full recovery, it will be complacent for us to assume that this will be the situation for all children infected with COVID-19. At our last press conference, SMS Janil provided an update on the cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIC for short, that had been treated in our public hospitals. In total, there have now been six cases of MIC in children, which have been catered, uh, cared for in our hospitals and reported to MOH. Of the six, three have made a good recovery and have been discharged home. They remain on follow-up with the specialists in our hospitals. Of the remaining three, one had initially been admitted to the pediatric ICU, but had responded well to treatment. He has since been transferred to the general ward and may be discharged soon, if he continues to recovery, uh, his recovery uneventfully. Another is being monitored in the high dependency ward in one of our hospitals and is being treated also for other concurrent infections. The last child is stable in the general ward. The children with MIC range from two months of age to 11 years old. Our best wishes are with the children and we are hopeful that all of these cases will have a good outcome. Thank you. Let me now invite uh, Minister Tan Siling to uh, share about uh, plans for migrant workers. Siling, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Gunn, and good evening, everyone. Uh, Ministry of Manpower has been steadily building up the resilience of our migrant worker dormitories. Over 98% of our migrant workers living in the dormitories are now fully vaccinated. The workers are also taking up booster vaccinations to strengthen protection as and when they become eligible. Now, 61% of fully vaccinated workers will become eligible for booster jabs over these three months up till January 2022. The response has been encouraging thus far, with 81% of these eligible workers to date having been administered with their booster shot. The rate of COVID-19 infections in the dormitories has declined over the past two to three weeks with an effective R0 of about 0.9. The seven-day multiple has also been below one, which means the cases are declining over the past few weeks. The vast majority of the infected workers are asymptomatic or display very mild symptoms. These workers are able to recover on their own, minimizing the strain on our healthcare system. About 0.1% to 0.2% of infected workers require hospitalization. Safe living, safe working, and safe rest day measures have also been implemented to mitigate the risks of transmission at workers' places of residence, work sites, and recreational areas. With the resilience at the dormitories built up, we have since September started to progressively ease movement restrictions for migrant workers residing in the dormitories into the community. We launched a pilot program for vaccinated migrant workers to visit pre-identified locations with the necessary safeguards in place to protect their health and their safety. Now, we expanded this community visit program from 30th October to increase the number of migrant workers and to include more locations as well as lengthen the duration of each visit. The program has been well received by our migrant workers and no infections have been detected amongst these participants who took part in the pilot thus far. The frequency of visits to recreation centres or RCs has also been gradually increased from once to now three times a week. Every step we take aims to balance the needs of our migrant workers alongside with the management of public health risks. I'm glad to announce, ladies and gentlemen, that we are now ready to expand the community and RC visit program. 
We will do this in two steps. First, starting from 3rd December, we will open the community visits to up to 3,000 vaccinated migrant workers per day. So let me repeat, 3,000 vaccinated migrant workers per day. And this is up from the current cap of 3,000 per week. That means a total of 21,000 per week. The workers will also be able to visit any location of their choice within the community beyond the two existing locations of Little India and Geylang Shrine. All the necessary safeguards, such as pre-visit testing via ART, will remain in place for public health considerations. At the same time, we will also make RC visits more accessible for migrant workers. They will be allowed to visit the RCs daily. This is up from three times weekly. We will also extend the duration of the visits to eight hours per visit, up from four hours per visit today. Next, in mid-December, we will further increase access to RCs and we will allow migrant workers to visit any RC of their choice so that this will enable them, allow them to meet with their friends and if they have family members living in the other dormitories as well. Our stakeholders' support remains vital as part of the ecosystem of care to and for our migrant workers. We seek employers and dormitory operators' support for their workers to fully utilise the programme. We will also need support from RC operators and the NGOs too. For example, we're working with RC operators and NGOs to expand the types of activities migrant workers can enjoy at the recreation centres, such as organising the screening of movies as well as sports games. Finally, I would like to thank our migrant workers for their continued patience and trust in us. We have only been able to achieve this progress with all of your cooperation and all of your support. Now, as the COVID-19 situation evolves, we will continue to prioritize your safety and your health as we monitor the situation and as we look to easing restrictions further. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll ask uh, Minister Iswaran to talk about uh, uh, our travel arrangements and border control. Iswaran, over to you. Thanks, Kim Yong. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have announced VTLs with 16 countries, two in North America, 10 in Europe, and four in the Asia Pacific. I'll now outline our plans to extend the VTL scheme to five more countries. First, Indonesia. MOH had earlier updated its public health assessment and upgraded Indonesia to Category 2 from the 12th of November. Singapore and Indonesia are close neighbours with strong economic and people-to-people -people ties. Singapore is the top foreign investor in Indonesia across various sectors including manufacturing, energy and logistics. Pre-COVID, Indonesia was among our top five markets for passenger arrivals at Changi Airport, accounting for about 10% in 2019. We have therefore been engaging Indonesia on restoring bilateral connectivity. We will launch a unilateral vaccinated travel lane with Indonesia from the 29th of November. We plan to start with two daily designated services between Singapore and Jakarta, and will progressively increase this to four. Indonesia A remains close to general travel, but has started to open its borders. Since the 14th of October, Indonesia has unilaterally reopened its borders to allow visitors from 19 countries. We hope that Indonesia will likewise soon reopen its borders to travelers from Singapore. Meanwhile, fully vaccinated travelers from Indonesia, as well as visitors, from our other VTL countries, which Indonesia has also opened to, such as France, Italy, and Spain, will be able to enter Singapore with testing in lieu of quarantine. Let me now turn to India. Ministry of Health has updated its public health assessment and will upgrade India to category two from the 19th of November. Our ties with India are long-standing and broad-based. 
India was among our top five markets, accounting for about 7% of passenger arrivals at Changi Airport in 2019. We have been discussing the mutual recognition of vaccination certificates, and with effect from the 12th of November, India has begun to recognize vaccination certificates issued by Singapore. This means that fully vaccinated travelers from Singapore entering India will no longer need to undergo post-arrival tests or home quarantine. They will just need to self-monitor for 14 days upon arrival. Building on this momentum, Singapore intends to start a vaccinated travel lane with India from the 29th of November. For this purpose, we are in discussions on the resumption of scheduled commercial passenger services, as today the only flights from Singapore allowed to carry passengers to India are government chartered relief flights under the Vande Bharat mission. Our discussions with India are progressing well, and we aim to resume two daily, flight, two daily VTL flights each to Chennai, Delhi, and Mumbai by the 29th of November. CAAS will provide more details once finalized. Let me turn to the Middle East. We have strong bilateral economic links with Middle East. There are over 400 Singapore companies based in the UAE alone, including ST Engineering, SamCorp and DBS. Similarly, Middle East companies have a significant presence here, often using Singapore as a hub for Southeast Asia. It is essential that we re-establish our connectivity with the Middle East. Fully vaccinated travelers from Singapore can already enter both the UAE and Saudi Arabia without quarantine, while Qatar requires that travelers self-isolate until they obtain a negative on-arrival PCR result. Singapore will extend VTLs to the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar from the 6th of December. And this will restore two-way travel with these countries, which is quarantine-free. Collectively, we aim to have three to four daily VTL flights with these countries. In addition, we will increase the daily quota for all our VTLs from 6,000 to 10,000. This is about 13% of the total daily arrivals at Changi pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, the 21 countries with whom we have VTLs contributed to just under 50% of the total daily arrivals at Changi. So our VTL quotas amount to about one quarter of the total pre-COVID flows from these countries. We will monitor the progress of the VTLs closely before deciding on further moves. Let me also take this opportunity, opportunity to address a couple of other issues in relation to the VTLs. First, there have been appeals from some travelers from the US facing difficulty getting their proof of vaccination recognized. The Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore has announced on the 13th of November that we will broaden the proof of vaccination recognized for travel from the US to help more travelers while it works to expand the list of US certificates that can be digitally verified. I hope that this will reassure and make it easier for those planning to travel to Singapore from the US, especially our overseas Singaporeans. Secondly, there have been concerns over the decision of the Council of the European Union to remove Singapore from the white list of countries for whom travel restrictions have been lifted. Last month, the US had also raised its COVID-19 health advisory for travel into Singapore. The global COVID-19 pandemic is evolving with the risk of new variants and waves of infection. So we must expect and accept that border policies may change as situations change. Hence, as our domestic situation evolves, some countries have adjusted their border measures for travelers from Singapore. Similarly, as I have emphasized before, we too will review and adjust our border measures based on the circumstances in other countries. Careful and calibrated reopening of our borders 
also means being prepared to make the necessary adjustments to and even curtail the VTL arrangements if warranted by the public health risk assessment. Meanwhile, as many Singaporean families are planning to travel, I urge all travellers to closely monitor the situation in the countries they are visiting, be well informed and updated on their latest public health and border measures, and plan ahead for contingencies. So to conclude, we are progressively expanding the VTL scheme as we gain experience and confidence from its implementation. And as we learn to live with COVID-19, we will persevere with reopening our borders safely to secure our position as a global business and aviation hub while retaining the flexibility to adapt quickly to the evolving pandemic situation. Good evening. Throughout this pandemic, we've had to make constant adjustments to our COVID-19 measures. Uh, we understand that it is not always easy for people to keep track of the changes in our measures. And from time to time, it also creates frustration uh, because of the perceived flip-flops in our COVID strategy. That's why we are trying very hard to avoid start-stops in our measures and to minimize the need to throttle back or to tighten. But I hope everyone understands it is very challenging to do this. And this challenge is not unique to Singapore. Countries everywhere face the same challenge. Take the example of Europe and see what's happening in there right now. A few months ago, Europe relaxed its measures and opened up its economy. And several people then said, oh, Singapore should follow suit. Having done so, Many European countries today are seeing a sharp spike in cases. And so several countries in Europe, including Austria, Denmark and Netherlands, have reimposed restrictions and even to the extent of reintroducing partial lockdowns. The point is, countries everywhere have to deal with these adjustments throughout the pandemic. For those of us with high vaccination rates, we would like very much to move forward to a situation where we live with the virus and treat it as an endemic disease. But we also have to deal with the reality that the virus comes in rolling waves of infection. And we therefore have to adjust our measures based on these waves in order to protect our healthcare system. And we have to keep on doing that until we reach a stabler equilibrium with the virus. This is the common challenge that countries everywhere are dealing with. That is why we believe the best strategy for Singapore going forward is to ease our measures in a controlled, careful and calibrated manner. And this applies to our border measures as well as to measures within our community. You have heard about our approach for the borders just now. Uh, within the community, we, have, we had announced some easing last week. We allowed for activities to resume for our students in schools and in our institutions of higher learning. We also announced easing for individuals from the same household to dine together in a restaurant up to a larger group of five persons. This has started and as you heard just now, we will be moving next with hawker centres and coffee shops so long as the hawker centres and coffee shop operators are able to put in place a proper access control and checking system. The other uh, way in which we can move forward with easing in a safe manner, in a careful, controlled, safe manner, is through the new vaccine and test protocol which we had also announced last week. We are using this to allow team sports to resume, starting with a group of 10 pe people, so you can play 5x5 five five sports. And we are also applying this to selected mice and sporting events. So we will 
make use of this vaccine and test protocol for several conferences that are taking place this month, including the Milken Conference, the Bloomberg Conference this week, as well as the Industrial Transformation Asia-Pacific Conference later this month. We will extend this same protocol for a concert, JJ Lin's two-day charity concert happening later in November, as well as a sporting event, and that's the One Championship Martial Arts event. Essentially, with the vaccine and test protocol, we will be able to ease some of the safe management measures for these events. And that includes uh, measures like capacity limits and zoning restrictions. Because with vaccine and test, we are not only limiting the participants to vaccinated persons, we are also requiring all of them to be tested beforehand. So it provides extra protection and safety. Based on the outcomes of these pilots, if they prove to be successful, we will then be able to extend this same protocol to more events and more settings. And this is another way in which we can resume more activities in a controlled and safe manner. So to conclude, this is the step-by-step -step incremental approach we will be taking in easing our measures. It's not a big bang, as we have said before. It's done in a controlled manner. And each time we make a move, we will monitor the situation for the next few days or one, two weeks, ensure that the overall infection situation is stable before we make the next move. So we have done some moves already. We will monitor the situation over the next few days. And early next week, we will give a further update on our possible next steps. And this is how we can together continue on our journey of reopening our economy and resuming more activities safely. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, Ministers and DMS. We will now begin the Q&A segment. Dear members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand function on Zoom if you would like to ask a question. And a reminder to keep to one question only. If you are called upon, you will be prompted to unmute yourself. Please do so accordingly. May we have the first question from ST Salma, please. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ministers, DMS. I just wanted to find out how good the booster shots are in protecting people. Would you be able to give us an idea, since the booster shots have been going on for some time, how many of those infected today have received their booster shots? How many of those who are seriously ill, as well as those who have died, have received their booster shots? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sama, for the question. We're actually compiling the data, and we should be able to release that to the public soon. I don't have the data with me today, so uh, watch the space. We'll get it to you, and we'll uh, make sure that uh, you have information concerning uh, how well the booster vaccine doses are doing. Yep, just to add that um, data, we, we don't have it, but we will be able to produce it and release it. But uh, it's very clear, the, with boosters, the probability of infection and the probability of severe illness has been further drastically reduced. I released some of the data just now for PPP and PPM, but those are for all ages and not for seniors alone. But for seniors, the impact has been stark and, and very significant. Thank you, Minister and DMS. Can we have the next question from Yun Zhou of Zaobao, please? Um. Thank you, Minister DMS. Uh, we have a question regarding the VTL with South Korea. Of course, we note that um, according to the newest regulations, which were announced on 10th November, the uh, individuals who are fully vaccinated in Singapore and have recovered from COVID infection will not be eligible to enter South Korea. Of course, uh, this individual may still test positive like, even though he or she has recovered. So just wondering whether uh, Singapore will be considering uh, implementing implementing similar measures for incoming VTL passengers from uh, Korea. Thank you. Iswara? Um, yep. Thank you for the question. The short answer is uh, we are not at this stage contemplating a similar measure uh, with respect to Korea, but we are monitoring the situation and we will, if it's warranted, take the appropriate steps and then make the announcements. 
Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can we have the next question from Jalela of CNA Digital? Thank you. Picking up on what has been announced about pilots for some MICE events, um, what consideration has been given to whether much bigger events next year like F1 can go ahead? And what consideration has been given to how spiking cases in Europe could impact events coming up soon such as Bloomberg NEF? Well, as I mentioned just now, with this new protocol, vaccine and test, we think it's possible to proceed with events with some easing of the safe management measures for these events. So a concert, you could have more people, a conference or a forum, you could have more people, and they, you know, the, some of the rules can be eased. This is what we are trying out with these pilots. And we will monitor the outcome of the pilots, as I said. If the outcomes prove to be effective, we will certainly then scale up the pilots or extend the protocol, the vaccine and test protocol, to more events, to more settings. So that is the plan. After the coming week or after the few events we have identified, we will have a better sense of the effectiveness of this new protocol and we will then consider extending it to more settings and events. Will the situation in Europe, the new spike impact on these measures, it really comes down to our border measures. Whether there is a spike in Europe or there's a spike anywhere in the world, it comes down to our border measures and being vigilant with regard to our borders as well. And that's why we continue to monitor you know, the infection rates of travelers who come into Singapore we look at these indicators very closely to make sure that even as we open our borders and have vaccinated travel with many countries, many more countries, we will not subject ourselves to greater risk of infection. Maybe I'll ask uh, I... Minister Iswaran to talk about uh, F1. Yep. Uh, thank you, Kim Yong. Uh, so to augment uh, Minister Lawrence Wong's point, as you would be well aware, our tourism and lifestyle sectors have been hard hit by COVID-19. And many events, including the past two editions of the Formula One race in Singapore, have been cancelled or postponed. Uh, yet, I think we all recognize that events such as the Formula One generate significant economic benefits and global branding value for Singapore. And they invigorate Singapore's events calendar they build our international demand and also support job creation and businesses. So for all these reasons, as we gradually ease measures and reopen our borders, we are also working towards a phased resumption of such international events with the essential safeguards which are informed by the public health assessment, risk assessment. So in that regard, specifically to your question, Dalila, in this, we are in discussions with Formula One management and the Singapore GP on a contract for a new term of the Formula One race in Singapore. Given my familiarity with the parties and issues, Minister Gunn has requested me to oversee this for MTI and we will provide more information in due course. Um, um, as the question also alluded to the situation in Europe, as mentioned by Minister Lawrence Wong, it depends on border measures and so far other than Denmark that has imposed some quarantine for Singapore-based travellers, other European EU countries have not, which means uh, the delegates to the conferences that are being held this week, particularly Bloomberg New Economy Conference, they have not been affected. Their itinerary will not be affected. But I should reiterate some of our assessment that I explained last week in our MTF conference. Infection rates have been going up across Europe. But so far, the infection rates are comparable to Singapore. You're not looking at infection rates that's way surpassing Singapore. The Netherlands have surpassed Singapore by a slight margin, but the rest are in fact comparable, in fact lower. Uh, but more importantly is the assessment that in Europe, it is really a pandemic of the unvaccinated. 
the countries that are now experiencing higher infections and then more hospitalization and deaths tend to be the countries where infection uh, where vaccination rates are relatively lower say around 70 percent some slightly below 70 percent so it's really the certain segments in your population unvaccinated that are now affecting uh, they are now infected and then filling up hospital places which also led to austria uh, implementing quite quite a, a drastic uh, measure of requiring unvaccinated persons to be actually isolated. Yeah. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from polling of Mediacorp Channel 8 TV News? Hi, Ministers and DMS, polling from Channel 8 TV News here. Before I ask my question, just wanted to wish Minister Ong happy birthday. Share quite a lot. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So my question is actually about hawker centres. So uh, we are opening up to allow households of five to dine in. So what would be the criteria that we are looking at? Are we looking at the smaller hawker centres first? Maybe you can give us some names that which one would be the first few that are opening. And eventually, is it that all hawker centres will be able to do so? I uh, would appreciate if you can get a reply in Chinese as well. Thank you. Well, it's not so much smaller, but NEA has been engaging all the hawker associations and town councils. The key is to have in place a proper system of access control and checks. Some hawker centres are ready to move first, so we expect the first group of hawker centres to do so by the end of this month, and then subsequently the other hawker centres should be able to follow suit and NEA will provide further details on which are these hawker centres. Um, 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 so VDS vaccination differentiated measures. Uh, 就是, um, VDS VDS的目的就是要保护没有接种的人士尤其是年长者所以他们在出去外面能够进什么场所进什么活动都受到一些限制就为了保护他们不要接触到这个病毒所以一些场所尤其人多的场所而且年长者比较常去的场所这个风险特别大所以两个场所就是有这样的一个一些困难就是小贩中心还有我们的咖啡店小贩中心这方面呢不久将来所有的小贩中心都会进行这个VDS的这个政策就是说要进入小贩中心要经过检查说你已经接种过疫苗完全接种过疫苗才能够进去能够进去的话就是每家户五个人也可以坐下来堂食就是跟餐厅一样环境发展环境局新加坡食品局正在筹备这方面的工作所以环境局已经跟许多的小
50% of our population is still not vaccinated, uh, then we jolly well roll out vaccination quickly and make it as accessible to them as possible, explain publicly why is it necessary to get vaccination and get more people to be vaccinated, as opposed to at 50% try to implement a VDS. We have avoided that approach, but instead we base on explanation, transparency, showing data, and I think many of our uh, individuals in the population look at this information and decided for themselves it's better to get vaccinated. So I think that is the correct approach. But when the number becomes smaller and smaller and become a minority and become very hard to persuade them, no matter how much information you put out for whatever personal or other reasons they do not want to, then our approach is let's try to protect them. And then let's protect them by having VDS. Amongst them, they are young and they are old. We never want to, this is never meant to be a, uh, this is never meant to be differentiation measures. This is meant to be a protection measures. Um, and differentiated measures is for the purpose of protection, not for the purpose of discrimination. They have their own reason and we respect their reason. We have not made uh, vaccination mandatory. So it is their choice, but if they choose not to, we need to have differentiated measures to protect them, whether you are young or you are old. And once you divide old, differentiated VDS apply only to the old and not the young, then I think you have really started to discriminate. And I think that will not be right. The message we put out to the public must be very clear. Vaccination is beneficial. Get yourself vaccinated for whatever reason you choose not to, then we need these measures to protect you regardless of your age. The final question comes from Deborah from CNA, please. Hi, good evening, ministers. Um, my question is on the migrant worker um, issue. So as much as the quota for the workers leaving dorms for recreational activities has been raised, you know, part of the reason for the cap is that they still live in quite cramped conditions. So can we get an update on the progress of the quick built dormitories and whether adequate action has been taken to move workers to improved housing? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, I think there are two parts to your question. First, on the raising of the quota. Uh, it was a process, um, and I've uh, said it many times, uh, we've always been trying to find a safe window. So when this uh, Delta variant um, sort of came here and um, we saw the numbers uh, climbing, we also needed to understand in terms of the, the vaccines, how effective they were. And after a couple of months of understanding the infectivity rates, understanding the types of complications that they were faced with, and also, most importantly, um, having clear understanding as to whether they needed hospitalization. And earlier on, I've alluded to the fact that only 0.1 to 0.2% of them needed hospitalization. And one thing of note is that after following them up, uh, I mean, I don't want to sort of belabor the point or, or, or jinx it in any way, but um, the vast majority of them have been well, they've been asymptomatic. And we have not, because of the fact that they've, uh, we have at 98% of them uh, having gone through uh, the double complete vaccination itself, there were people with very few complications. And um, like I said, touch wood, we have not had a single death due to COVID amongst the migrant workers this year. So because of that, we were able to, in a very calibrated and careful manner, ensure that as we completed one pilot after another successfully, we could now then take a bolder step of increasing the number to 3,000 per day to visit the community. And pari parcel with that, we also eased the restrictions in the recreation centres for them to be able to visit on a daily basis. And as a part of the plan to ease the visits to the community, we also allow migrant workers to visit different recreation centres so that they can get together with their friends or their family members here in Singapore. Now, we envisage that for start, when we do this 3,000 per day, they can visit once the community in probably about a couple of months. Now, the plan is that as we progressively roll it out even more, the plan is actually to ease it even more. Of course, 
the caveat is that we should not uh, be hit by another variant or that there shouldn't be um, you know, some huge uh, uptake. Now, as of end to your second point about quick build dumps, today, as of end 2021, there are 16 quick build dumps um, at 11 locations. Four of them have been repurposed into onboarding centers for migrant workers coming in from overseas. Now, what is important is that we have actually completed a review of the entire ecosystem of the, uh, the, the dormitories that the migrant workers today reside in. <coughs> we have also worked with different uh, um, industry leaders. We have also worked with the associations and we've also worked with academia, um, health authorities to understand the layout, to study the ventilation, to also look at communal facilities and so on. And we have worked out a roadmap as to how we're going to transform the entire migrant worker living universe within Singapore itself. Now, Deborah, you can appreciate the fact that we do have quite a lot of DOMS because they don't just include the purpose-built DOMS. We have got the factory converted DOMS. We've got the construction temporary quarters uh, and also the temporary living quarters there. So it takes us some time to be able to completely and comprehensive do a review of, of the study of all of these dormitories. And that's precisely what our FAST teams, uh, MOM teams, have been doing on the ground for the past many months. Now, we will, in the measures, in the initiatives, in the plans, implementation, moving forward, we will need a runway to gradually, won't be that gradual, but to transition these dorms into higher standards, into better living conditions, and even uh, a more welcoming uh, type of living environment for all of them. So it is actually the runway now that we need to build this thing. And obviously, um, because of the fact that uh, there, are, there are so many operators involved, we are also bringing them on board with us. I hope that sort of gives you a, a, a clearer, clearer roadmap as to what we are envisaging and what we are doing. Thank you.